started. I'll do my intro. Good evening and welcome to the Belfast Garden Club Evening Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the All of Belfast Climate Dialogues Project of the Belfast Free Library. Tonight's presentation, Growing Food and Ornamentals in a Ch Changing Climate with Haley Jean and Sarah Kelman, students at the University of Maine School of Food and Agriculture, is the second in our three-part series focusing on the effect of the climate crisis on our forests, farms, and gardens. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library, and I wanna thank you all for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Belfast Garden Club Program Committee members, Susan Connard and Corliss Davis. Before I turn the mic over to Susan to introduce our speakers, I would like to mention that this program is all part of the All of Belfast Climate Dialogues, or ABCD, a project of the Belfast Free Library, which we created to help all residents in our area talk about climate change and its impact in order to increase awareness and help us all prepare for the challenges ahead. I invite you to go to, the Bel to our website, belfastlibrary.org, and follow the link to all of Belfast Climate Dialogues to learn how to participate and look for future programs. Tonight's program is being recorded and you will be able to, um, and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel, which you may access from many various places on our website. So during the presentation, please keep your mic muted and type any of your questions into the chat. And during the Q&A, Corliss Davis will read them at, when we get to the Q&A. And with that, I will turn the mic over to Susan Connard. Go ahead, Susan. Thanks, Brenda. I think Brenda just about said everything. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention that this is the second in a series of three presentations um, talking about climate change as it relates to gardens, farms, and natural resources. And the third will be on March 22nd in the evening. And it will be, it's called Deep Woods, How Climate Change Impacts Forests and How Forests Slow Climate Change. So a slightly different topic. Um, Haley and Sarah are graduate students at University of Maine, but they both took time between college and graduate school and got some really good experience working on farms, in educational programs, and that sort of thing. So uh, I think you'll really enjoy their talk, and they will tell you a little bit about themselves. So go ahead, Haley and Sarah. All right. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Brenda. And it's just going to take me a little second to get all of our stuff set up. So just to mention, we'll hold the questions until after the presentation, unless there's something that comes up that's really critical to be answered during. But please put them in the chat as you think of them. There you see the slides. Yes. Yep. Perfect. All right. Here we go. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. We are very excited to be talking to everyone um, and that everyone's thinking about climate change and how we can deal with the impacts in our food system and in our gardens. Uh, thanks to the Belfast Library and to the Belfast Garden Club for setting this up. And we hope that everyone has fun. And, oh, sorry. And so just a little about us, um, we both work in the agroecology lab at UMO, working towards our master's degree as, as already mentioned. And we are working at the intersection of the food system and climate change. And for those of you who don't know or are unfamiliar with agroecology, it's a branch of science focused on sustainable agriculture that incorporates ecological processes and human needs. So some of the aspects of the food system that we might consider uh, when thinking about our research and our work would be like food traditions, efficiency, system resilience, and other natural and cultural variables. And so I'm Haley and 
in, I'm in my final semester at University of Maine, <laughs> working towards my master's degree in plant soils and environmental sciences. I have a passion for studying nutrient movement and climate change. I'm excited to be learning how to best support Mainers needs through my research. Uh, my research centers on sustainable water use, looking through it at many lenses. So I look at water access, water management, the effects of projected precipitation events. And in the future, I'm hoping to work to provide support in implementing sustainable water management resources on a farm, but also at homes. Um, and before I came to graduate school, I worked in Vermont. Uh, I worked for Vermont Extension, mostly doing cereal grain and hops research. And I also worked with a lot of farmers um, dealing with some of the challenges that we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm also a master's student at UMaine. And I am really interested in how climate change affects farmer decision-making and farm resilience and how education and outreach and technical assistance can help farmers adapt to a changing climate. So basically, that means that I'm really excited about getting relevant and useful climate focused information into farmers hands when they need it. And in my current research, I'm studying uh, farmer perspectives on conservation agriculture practices and trying to understand what motivates them to use these practices and keep using them even when they come up against challenges. And before moving to Maine for graduate school, I managed a farm to school program in California and worked on farms in both California and Washington state. And if I can interrupt really quickly, another important part of agroecology is that it's interdisciplinary. And so I am a physical scientist and Sarah is a social scientist. And we get to collaborate, yeah. which is awesome. <laughs> So today I'm gonna to be starting our talk with a quick discussion of what risk and vulnerability are and how they can be assessed and quantified for reasons we'll discuss. Then I'll quickly talk about some climate threats to our global food system. After that, I'll hand it over to Haley, who's gonna go over some climate threats that we're facing in the Northeast and more directly in Maine, both on a regional scale and then more directly how they affect the crops and plants in our gardens. And then she's going to talk a little bit about what we can do to protect our crops and gardens. And then I'll wrap it up with some other tactics to make our food system and home gardens more resilient. Okay, so why are we starting here with risk and vulnerability assessments? The answer is that when we think about climate change, we're thinking about massive change on a global scale in ways that are really difficult to imagine and sometimes difficult to quantify. And we know that change is coming and then it's going to be big, but how big is big? And will a storm of you know, X size affect two communities the same way? We know the answer to that last question is no, it won't. So frameworks like this help us to put change and vulnerability into perspective and help us to identify underlying factors that might change the way that two different places are able to respond to a climate shock. So basically we use vulnerability and risk assessments for a couple of reasons. We use them to make comparisons, to ensure that resources are directed towards those in need, to reduce risk of unexpected outcomes and to interrogate governance and other systems like the food system to understand and explain where pressure points or system failures might be occurring. And because we're discussing the effects of climate change tonight, I thought it would be useful to start out by sharing with you how scientists and policymakers identify climate vulnerability across scales from global to municipal. So it's important to point out that there are many, many, many ways to assess risk and vulnerability and some are used more often than others. What you're seeing here are two versions of the IPCC's vulnerability assessment framework. And the one on the left is the newer version and the one on the right is older. Nope, the one on the left is older. The one on the right is newer. We won't dive into the intricacies and definitions too much in these, but I think it's worth understanding that defining and quantifying these phenomena helps us to grasp how climate change is gonna affect various countries, economic sectors, and ecosystems. I think these terms are a little bit tricky to understand without a real example to apply to them. So we're gonna do that now in order to get a little bit of a feel for how these concepts can be operationalized. 
So I'm going to walk you through an example of a global agriculture vulnerability assessment so that you can understand where these terms come from and how they're applied. So first, uh, exposure is the effect of climate change projections on the resource or area in question. So for this example, we're thinking about how agricultural yields are projected to change. So here, that means comparing measured rates from the beginning of the century to projected rates at the end of the century, taking into account what we know about shifts in temperature and precipitation across the globe. And you can see that the US is gonna experience a drop in productivity, but it's not gonna be as great as what we see in Western Africa or East Asia meaning that we can say that the US's exposure is lower than in some of those other countries. So sensitivity, I like to think of it as this country will be more or less sensitive to the impact of an exposure to climate change's effects on agriculture because of its reliance or lack thereof on agriculture. So something's only as sensitive as its reliance on the thing that might be changing as a result of climate change. Countries that are extremely sensitive to the effects of climate change on agriculture because of their dependence on it include, for example, Mali and Yemen. Adaptive capacity is the ability of a place, person, or region to deal with the effects of exposure and sensitivity. In this case, the authors of this report chose to use the average per capita GDP projected to the end of the century to represent adaptive capacity. This is because GDP per capita is commonly used to estimate a country's ability to mobilize resources to adapt to climate change. And so cumulatively, all of these aspects add up to a, a country's vulnerability in terms of how agriculture and climate change will interact. And this also means that each country has been given a numerical value for each of these aspects, meaning that you can order them and compare them, which I think is pretty cool and useful. Before we move on to our discussion of vulnerability, I just wanna mention that scale definitely matters when you're thinking about assessing vulnerability. And what I mean by this is you have to ask yourself, does the system I'm looking at respond to changes that I alone am capable of making, or is this something that's much bigger than me? In this presentation, we're gonna be thinking about different levels of risk to food producers that climate change poses and different effects of exposure to hazards based on scale. The risk and exposure can be affected by the amount you're managing, so if you're gardening as supplemental food for your family or you're farming for a living, two to very different scales, or if you're gardening for pleasure or you own a landscaping company. And one thing that's exciting about this presentation is working on a small scale like a garden is great because you are in control of so many of the variables and so you have more of an opportunity to experiment with different adaptive practices with less risk. And on that note, we're going to head back up to the global scale so I can tell you a little bit more about how climate change is going to impact agriculture broadly. The first thing we're going to talk about is the effect of climate change on yield. So more carbon dioxide in the air makes plants more efficient at absorbing the gas and consequently plants lose less water during photosynthesis, which is better for growth. With sufficient water and other nutrients, crop yields can increase significantly and greenhouse and field experiments have shown that higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can act as a fertilizer and increase plant growth. However, yield declines will be notable in some parts of the world, especially in the tropics where water access, so drought and high temperature will be problematic and will not make carbon dioxide act as a fertilizer. Under a business as usual type emission scenario, 90% of the world's population, most of whom live in the most sensitive and least developed countries, are projected to be exposed to losses of food production well, less than 3% live in regions that would experience productivity gains by 2100. 
in Latin America, Central and Southern Africa, and Southeast Asia, which are all highly dependent on agriculture for employment, food security, and revenue, they're all going to be highly impacted by these climatic shifts. Models suggest that the northern margin of the agricultural climate is going to move northwards faster than boreal forests and tundra can shift north. So if agriculture moves north into this previously unfarmable land and deforestation does occur, this would mean that 32% of the world's forest carbon stock would be at risk. Deforestation leads to decomposition, which emits carbon dioxide, and therefore the shift of agriculture northwards would probably result in a net increase of greenhouse gas emissions. However, it's important to note that a shift northwards into previously unfarmable land could also result in offsetting reductions in food output from the areas that currently supply a lot of the world's food, but would be highly negatively impacted by climate change. So one estimate suggests that a conversion of 10 to 20% of Northern areas that are potentially suitable for agriculture by 2100 might feed between a quarter billion and 1 billion people. Improved yields can also have trade-offs with nutrition. So crops grow bigger and faster with higher CO2, but protein and micronutrient content is proportionally lower. In countries where diets are fairly uniform, so not a diverse calorie stream and meat consumption is low and the population mostly eats cereal, grains, and legumes, the effect will be felt the most. Um, in an experiment simulating future elevated carbon dioxide, rice, wheat, barley, and potato protein content decreased between six and 14%, which means that by 2050, assuming today's diets and levels of income inequality, an additional 1.6% or 148.4 million of the world's population may be at risk of protein deficiency because of elevated carbon dioxide. Globally under elevated carbon dioxide, decreases that are larger than 7% in protein intake are predicted for plant-based diets with countries dependent on wheat and rice particularly affected including in Central Asia, North Africa, the Middle East, Central and Eastern Europe, and China, which you can see in the figure on the left. This will also increase the severity for those who are already facing protein deficiency. Elevated carbon dioxide concentration will also affect iron concentrations in C3 grains, which is wheat and rice, and legumes, so that's field peas and soybeans. In field experiments, these crops have been found to have significantly lower concentrations of zinc and iron when grown at the elevated atmospheric CO2 concentration predicted for the middle of the century. And iron deficiency results in reduced capacity for physical activity, can lower IQ and increase maternal and child mortality. And it already impacts roughly a billion people worldwide. When grown under field conditions at a carbon dioxide concentration expected by 2050, wheat, rice, barley, soy, and field peas have significantly reduced zinc content between 5 and 13.6%. This reduction will threaten an additional 138 million people concentrated in Africa and Southeast Asia with the risk of zinc deficiency. It's also worth mentioning that this estimate does not take into account population growth and therefore is probably an underestimate. And zinc deficiency has been consistently shown to be associated with risk of premature delivery and reduced growth and weight gain in infants and young children, as well as compromised immune function and increased susceptibility to morbidity and mortality from infectious diseases. The people who are most vulnerable to the nutritional effects of rising CO2 concentrations are those who receive the smallest proportion of their dietary zinc from animal food sources. And these tend to be the poorest people within a country or region. 
So I wanted to show all of these maps here together one more time for you to look at, because I think it's really important to see illustrated the fact that we are living in a world with real climate winners and losers. So productivity will increase in the global north and the food supply of the future will be more accessible and diverse in the global north. This means that the impact of reduced plant nutrition on human diets will be felt less acutely by those in the north and especially in industrialized countries with access to capital. Thus, the brunt of the burden that is the shift in agricultural productivity and nutrition caused by climate change will be felt by those living in developing countries, mostly in the global south, where food supply will be negatively impacted and the diets of most of the population will suffer as diversity of available food choices is low and the food available will have a lower nutritional value. But I think it's also important to mention that now that these potential nutrition issues are understood or better understood, becoming understood, there's a lot of work going on to try to reduce these potential impacts, which includes breeding plants for reduced effect of increased CO2 concentrations on nutrient and mineral availability. So on that note, I'm gonna pass the mic off to Haley who's gonna take us down from the global scale to the regional and then to the garden specific scale to look at climate risks. Yes. Take it away. <laughs> so climate change in the Northeast. When we talk about the Northeast, I wanna be very specific that that means from Maryland down to, or I guess from Maine down to Maryland, sorry. Um, this is a really quite a widespread um, and even within this little region, there are different climate effects. So I'll do my best job to bring it back to Maine when I can. And so we'll go over most of these little bullets in depth, but I just wanted to touch on them here. The first effect that we'll see is rising temperatures. Though this rise will not be evenly just distributed over the season, the second thing that we'll see is an increase in agricultural drought or dry spells. Uh, so this really just means that it isn't drought over months or years like we see out west. In Maine, Maine in particular, and the whole Northeast is projected to increase in precipitation. Though again, this precipitation is not evenly distributed and it often is just in singular rain events. We'll see a change in the growing season, so a lengthening growing season, which will give people a lot more opportunity to play around. Um, and then we'll also see a change in hardiness zones. Along with this, we'll see <laughs> a, a change in pests behavior and also disease. And to adapt to all of this, we're kind of have to learn from our, our environment and rely on biodiversity. And so like most parts of the world, the Northeast is facing an increase in most air and soil temperatures. And in the last decade, temperatures across the nation have raised by an average of two degrees. Um, but in Maine, the average has been 3.5 degrees. Most models suggest that this increase, this increase in Maine will be another 2.4 degrees by the middle of the century and another 10 degrees by the end of the century. But that's using the highest emission models and hopefully we can all team together and not do that, but we'll see. Uh, these are the average temperature shifts, which is often how we talk about temperature change. Um, but hopefully with this gradual increase in temperatures, so I would argue that 10 degrees over the next 6, 80 years is not too gradual. But hopefully our plants can adjust to some of these seasons and hopefully we can adjust to these seasons. But it is not the full story. We're also projected to have an uneven distribution of temperatures across the seasons. It is projected that winter temperatures will increase more drastically than summer temperatures and that the coldest day of the year will increase by 9.51 degrees by the mid-century, so that's 2050, compared to the hottest day of the year that will increase by 6.51 degrees. 
plants will have a harder time adjusting to these drastic shifts that happen over the season. And we'll put about two thirds of our plants, animals and habitats in either high or moderately high vulnerable climate, moderately high vulnerability to climate change, sorry. <laughs> so when we talk, I wanna talk a little bit about plant risk on, so that people kind of understand what's happening to their plants on their property, their farm or their garden. And so when we talk about temperature, we have to consider both high and low temperatures, which even with this drastic increase in average temperature, we will still face cold, <laughs> cold temperature risks. I would like to focus on high temperatures first and most of the discussion will be about high temperatures, but we'll touch a little bit on cold snaps. Firstly, and probably the most obvious, is high temperatures <laughs> increase soil temperature and air temperature. Uh, secondly, we'll see an increase in evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is a combination of evaporation that's from the ground and other surfaces, and then transpiration, which is through leaf, loss of water through leaf, to three leaves, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Um, and I apologize if I overdefine, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. The third point I wanted to make was that we'll see an increase in the water holding capacity of the air. This causes an uneven distribution of water across the region. So in areas where water is being absorbed into the air, it will be able to absorb more, drying out that area, moving that water, to have heavier rain events in different areas. And we'll see a change in the hardiness zone also. Warmer zones are creeping north, um, which is some has some positives to it. And last but not least, plant behavior and function will change in high heat. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how your crops and your plants might react to climate change because often climate change seems in Maine at least, this kind of broad concern um, that we don't really in directly interact with every day. But when we're talking about temperature risks, we also need to touch both on high and low temperatures as I've already said. But again, we're gonna talk about high temperatures first. Often our crops are not faced with just high temperatures though. Uh, they are also faced with this, at the same time with water stress, um, which sort of has the similar effect on our plants. And so these two stressors together kind of exacerbate their problems. But for the most part, I'm going to try to parse out uh, these stresses individually. So high temperatures allow... Um, will reduce plant availability, pl sorry, plants ab ability <laughs> to photosynthesize, to uh, transpirate uh, becomes less efficient uh, because those stomatas are closing and it's trying to hold all of that water and really maximize its water use. High temperatures can have effect on root development and cause root clumping. So it kind of just all kind of stays in a ball at the bottom and you're not really accessing all of that water and all of those nutrients that you can. And this develop, this obviously would, re this would obviously affect the, the plant's ability to uptake nutrients, even with ideal soil moisture. When soil temperature rises above an optimum threshold, plant water and nutrient uptake can be impeded, causing damage to plant components. Extreme air temperature coupled with extreme soil temperature can cause varying degrees of damage to different plant parts. And this is because the rate the plant is able to uptake water and therefore nutrients is severely reduced. And if high heat is sustained for a long period of time, this slows the uptake and will cause permanent damage to the plant, even if the rest of your system is ideal, ideal moisture, ideal 
nutrient levels. Um, but if there's a really heavy heat wave during flowering and pollination, this also could make the plant abort its flowers and even try to abort its fruit because it wants to save all of that energy to put into the plant matter that it already has. And so now to touch on cold temperatures really quickly. Uh, in the Northeast, because our winters and springs are getting warmer and we are seeing plant development starting earlier, um, this lengthens our growing season, but we are still seeing cold snaps in the spring. And so when like when fruit or flowers are already starting to form, if there's a, a frost that will stunt the growth or even halt the growth altogether, um, which will affect the quality and yield of your crop or your plants, it will also it could also sterilize your flowers. If it's not necessarily the flowers, if it's just new buds or new plant growth, it could cause the water in the plants to freeze. It would and then go limp and the plant really can't recover from that. So managing temperatures. Temperature is one of those things where there's a lot of ways to manage temperature in your garden um, that are quite fun. It's harder on a farm scale, <laughs> but in your garden, there's a lot to play around with. And so starting with frost, this time, things that you could consider doing are variety selection or site selection. So you could choose a perennial and perennials tend to be more resilient against frost damage because they're already established root systems and they have deeper roots. They just have more support. <laughs> and if you cho are you're choosing to plant annuals, Think about your planting date, um, really consider when you want to harvest and how, what effects that plant is gonna see over its infancy, I suppose. So another way to avoid frost damage is through structures like hoop houses or small caterpillars. Um, this creates a barrier between the crop and the frost. So it doesn't allow that frost to freeze the water within the, within the plant. And you can also use things like mulching, row covers, intercropping, if you are worried about your root system. So if you have sensitive roots, cover up the soil. You should also keep your eyes on the weather and move any plants that you can, either inside your house, into a greenhouse, into some, some structure on your, on your property or on your land. Uh, things that could be moved are something like seedlings or potted plants. So a lot of potted plants are highly susceptible to changes in the environment because their soil is so small. <laughs> um, or you can simply cover valuable plants, uh, crops and plants. This is definitely the maybe the most risky, but it could help in the short term. So next onto high temperatures. If you notice the problem early or in a previous season, you could consider using a different variety or even if different crop altogether. Um, make sure that you look up the temperature rating for that area and how it might fit with your soil and all of those things. But in a garden setting, you really have a chance to play around. You can also just consider moving that crop or that flower or whatever you want into a different field or a different part of your yard because microclimates are, can really make a huge difference for crops like this. Uh, you can even create your own microclimate, like something like a windbreak for shade. Windbreaks create microclimates that can help productivity if shade is needed or shelter to reduce evaporation or trans or evapotranspiration. Shade also helps protect from the sun during the day and then reduces your heat loss at night. So these wide fluctuating temperature shifts um, can be minimized by 
things like windbreaks. You can use things like row cover, shade cloth, overhead irrigation or something like that to reduce the temperature in, in a small area. Shade cloth is very useful. It's used on farms a lot. I'm not sure about gardens. Sarah might know, I'm not sure. Um, but for most vegetables, a 30 to 50% shade cloth is recommended. The shade cloth should not come in contact with the plants. Otherwise the heat that is absorbed by the cloth can burn the plants and the shade cloth should be securely attached to poles, hoops and other methods of keeping it elevated and secure because if it falls over in the wind, you could also lose your crop, which is not always great. Uh, shade cloth prevents against sunburn in fruits as well as protecting a plant itself by keeping the soil cooler which reduces plant water requirements also. So I said I was trying to separate them, but I'm not. <laughs> you can also do things like adjust cropping dates or planting dates or um, harvest dates. If it's your home garden, it might be as simple as spacing out things a week separate. Maybe you wanna put five tomatoes in one week and five tomatoes in the next week so that you can space out when those plants are being affected by uh, the climate. You can manage your soil moisture to reduce crop sensitivity to heat stress. So just making sure your plants are as happy and as healthy will always help with whatever stressor you're facing. So in short, there are many ways to create a more resilient garden against heat and really a lot of ways that is within a budget. So whatever your budget might be, uh, you can try to address heat. <laughs> so onto drought or dry spills. Uh, temperature is inherently linked to the, to the hydraulic system. It's just, it, it's linked to everything. <laughs> but as previously mentioned, high temperatures affect water stress. And on top of warm temperatures increasing evapotranspiration from plants, high temperatures increase the atmosphere's ability to hold water, which I've mentioned a little. This increases the speed of evaporation and, high, and higher holding capacity can lead to some areas being very, very dry and some areas being very, very wet. And just like temperatures, the distribution of precipitation will not be equally covered across the year where there are really heavy rain events, mostly in the winter and the spring, and very little change over the rest of the year, which we're starting to sort of see a little bit, leaving the summers and the fall at higher risk for episodic droughts or these agricultural droughts. And you can see on the left, uh, the heavy rain events have already increased by 71%. And you can see on the right, that projected, even with this increase in heavy rain events, the projected soil moisture depth will decrease, or I suppose increase, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. But all this means is that the topsoil will be more affected by high temperatures at a deeper level. So high temperatures will be able to dry the topsoil out instead of one centimeter, maybe three centimeters. So in 2019, the Northeast went through a significant drought and it was pretty devastating for vegetable producers and specialty crop producers. Um, and people struggled to have their specialty crops. And so drought has somewhat of a similar uh, physio physiological effect on plants as high temperatures, such as the reduction of photosynthesis and the closing of those stomatas when under drought stress, plants will reduce the intake of CO2, as Sarah mentioned, uh, causing a reduction in growth and development. Because nutrients up are uptaken by plants through water, drought often causes nutrient deficiencies. All of these stressors can cause a plant to abort its flowers and fruits, which leads to a reduction in yield and quality of crops. 
When thinking about mitigating drought, the obvious solution is water. <laughs> so setting up an irrigation system takes time and planning. On a farm scale, investment in water access, like drilled wells and efficient irrigation systems will be key. On a large scale area, investing in soil moisture monitoring and routine assessment of risk is also really valuable. On a home scale, you can take all of these practices and really apply them to your land um, on a, or pick and choose. Thinking about water access is still really key in, at home because you don't want to necessarily be using your well or put more pressure on your personal well. So something like collecting water in rain barrels might satisfy your water needs for your garden because during a one inch rainfall, a roof that's a thousand square feet yields about 500 gallons of water. And so using rainfall can really benefit plants because as trace elements of um, like nutrients that are really good for plants, those micronutrients, it also has the correct pH uh, for it's a, high, a little acidic. And so plants need the correct pH and since it's the same temperature as, outdoor, as the outdoors, you won't shock your roots with the water you use. You can also improve your soil health and avoid soil compaction. This can go a long way to increase your soil's ability to hold moisture and avoid bare soil. Adding cover crops will make soils less susceptible to evaporation and help retain moisture. Ground cover can be helpful with the retaining of moisture. You can use a low maintenance crawling plant or mulch. Um, you should really consider the amount of resource that that crawling plant will use, but that's up to you. Uh, drought has some of the same symptoms as, as nutrient deficiency because it does cause nutrient deficiency. And people's instinct might be to fertilize but overfertilization is not um, recommended because this increases the plant growth and we want all of the plant's energy going to the current vegetation. And so we're just making sure that you're focusing on, on that current plant. So you could also do something like pruning. Pruning would help because you want all all the plant's energy to go to the part you want. You also want to remove weeds because this just reduces the competition for your crop. So flooding. <laughs> flooding is another big part of what Maine is going to go through. And so in Maine, annual precipitation has increased 6.6 .6 inches since 1895 with most of that being in rainfall in the winter and spring with less snowfall, which is sad. Uh, the most extreme storms, two to four inches of rainfall are becoming much more common with one year storms now happening about every seven months. In the last few years, I think that we can all attest to this sort of being the norm, we should, expect that our fields and yards will be very wet in the spring. Large rain events are becoming more frequent before the ground has fully thawed, creating pooling. And if the water cannot go through the soil column, it will soak into that top few inches of thawed topsoil and then move through the landscape, off of the landscape, uh, creating high amounts of erosion in the spring. These wet soils can also be more susceptible to soil compaction, and they might not be suitable to actually plant in the spring. So if you have annuals, uh, planting them with their smaller root will cause a lack of oxygen, which will hurt the plant. So even though our temperatures show that we're going to have a longer growing season, it will be variable depending on when we can actually get out into the field and work the land. So flooding might be the hardest for home, garden, home gardeners to fight against. Um, at least I 
I didn't come across any good solutions. So if people have them, throw them in the chat. Uh, but in agriculture and on farms, they're now moving to systems like tile drainage that farmers are, they're just kind of starting to invest in these new tile drainage systems um, that kind of wick all of, the all of their excess moisture off of their field, but they're expensive. And home gardeners investing in these flood, preventative flooding practices, um, it might be too high of an investment. Most of these practices rely on hardscaping. So doing things like contour planting and terracing and building swales and building raised beds. And I wouldn't know if that's called hardscaping, but um, all those things avoid, help avoid flooding, but they're a little bit more expensive. Where you can also work on your soil health. So making sure that your soil is less compact, has more organic matter so it can retain um, more moisture and so that it slows it down and allows it to really percolate through the soil and not um, erode all of your topsoil off of your land. You can just simply avoid wet areas in your garden if that's possible. You can use contour planting if you're already on a slope. If you make your home garden in the direction of that slope so that your aisles are going down with the water, that water will move quicker off of the land. And then you can put things like hay or old leaves in the aisles to kind of slow down that water so that it doesn't erode your topsoil, but it's also still moving away from your plants. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> but you can ask questions later. I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah again, and she's gonna wrap it up with some they're just fun little tidbits. Fun little tidbits. Just yeah. some extra fun <laughs> stuff. Um, and I'll try to move through this kind of quickly um, in the interest of time. So nearly 40% of all of the invasive plants now in the United States were originally introduced as ornamentals. So be careful with your ornamentals. <laughs> and these species affect nearly every ecosystem in the country and are continuing to expand into new areas. So invasive species tend to have really broad ranges so they can thrive in a lot of ecosystems. And for this reasons, um, they're, they're, these are the plants of our future, whether you like it or not, because they can move both assisted and unassisted faster than a lot of native species whose range is decreasing rather than increasing because of climate change. And because a lot of the introduced ornamentals are more prevalent in states to our south, and many species are shifting their ranges to the north to, in response to climate change. The northeast is a hot spot for risk for invasiveness. In the bottom figure here, you can see that parts of northern Maine are projected to have 100 new invasive plants um, by 2050, which is a lot. Um, uh, interesting and kind of con controversial thing that people are working on is called assisted migration. So because range is decreasing for native species faster than they can move, um, native plants from slightly warmer climates are being moved kind of north or poleward. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting idea because it's kind of complicated. You know, do we want to be moving like, it, what if they become invasive? Will they survive? Do we want to be promoting species migration? So it's just interesting to think about what might be native to your area in 50 years, or you can simply garden with native plants. Um, increased weed and pest pressure associated with longer growing seasons and warmer winters is going to be an increasing challenge. In Maine, there are already examples of earlier arrival and increased populations for some insect pests, including corn earworm, flea beetle, and spotted wing drosophila, all of which overwinter in the Northeast and are now present at higher levels earlier in the season. 
And this trend is going to continue as temperatures warm and more pests from southern states expand their reach into the northeast. Um, warmer winters are also going to increase survival rates for crop diseases whose populations expand uh, with earlier and wetter springs. And many of the most aggressive weeds will benefit more than crop plants from higher atmospheric carbon dioxide. So they're going to grow more densely and more quickly than the crops that they're competing with. Um, and hardier weeds under increased carbon dioxide also can be more resistant to some herbicide treatments. So as we talked about on the last slide, gardeners and farmers in the Northeast should expect weeds, insects, and plant diseases from further south as they migrate into the region. Luckily, we have a wealth of information that extension offices in those states can provide to us as these pests become an issue for people in Maine. And also over on the right here, you can see that the UMaine extension is a wonderful resource for gathering information about plant diseases and pests that you might find in your garden right now. And in the future, they're looking at new pests as well. Um, biodiversity promotes ecosystem functioning, which in turn promotes healthy soils and plant growth. Monocultures are vulnerable to climate impacts and less resilient than biodiverse ecosystems. Um, rotating crops especially can help improve soil organic matter concentration and soil porosity, which can improve water holding capacity. And this helps plants survive in drought conditions. Diverse rotations can also increase diversity and activity of the soil microbial community which in turn can improve nutrient availability and organic matter retention. Um, generally, a biodiverse plant population supports greater biodiversity broadly. And through this, the system can be more resilient to climate shocks, including extreme rain events and drought. Um, quickly, so on the right, just to explain this figure, I think the one on the left, Hopefully you guys can figure it out, but the one on the right, um, you can, so I just want to explain that um, adding a prairie alley strip to a corn crop basically just means adding some native grasses in between the rows of corn and it improves the erosion outcomes a lot because the roots are able to hold all of that soil in. And it's also improving biodiversity. You can see there's more bird species, more insect species, and more plant species in the surrounding area. So in this system, diversity improves outcomes, not just for the agricultural system, but also for the surrounding area. Okay, last but certainly not least, <laughs> pollinators. So, um, Pollinators aren't directly affected by climate change, but their habitats and available forage is changing as plants range changes and temperature and precipitation changes. So the availability of preferred forms of forage, especially for specialist pollinators is decreased. And climate change also has the potential to affect the distribution of pollinators and the plants they pollinate, as well as the timing of flowering and migration. So as the climate changes, the habitats that are suitable for supporting pollinators might change with some areas being lost as others are newly created. So when a habitat disappears, the pollinator is unable to move to a new habitat, uh, local extinction can occur. And climate change can also disrupt the synchrony between the flowering period of plants and the activity season of the pollinators. So they fail to match up in the way that they normally do. Um, the impact of climate change can also um, have effects on many of the complex interactions like predation, competition, and disease that constitute ecosystem functioning. So that's a little bit less known. And there, there might be mismatches in the timing between um, when interdependent species occur especially when changes in some species are cued by day length and others are by temperature. So small variations in weather caused by climate change can affect the water, nectar, and pollen that pollinators rely on. So 
Providing good pollinator habitat can help to make pollinators more resilient to the effects of climate change. So we're gonna talk about some of those very quickly. So one thing you can do is change your mowing practices to flavor, favor flower abundance. So that means you can either not mow, which is my preferred method, <laughs> or if you have to mow, um, you can mow in rotation. So you can divide it into a grid and mow on alternating weeks. And you can also plant species that uh, bees visit in order to provide forage. So you're looking for at least three species that are in flower during any one point during the growing season. Um, and in terms of habitat, uh, bees like to nest in hollow plant stems and beetle holes in trees. So you can provide these resources by letting plants grow in a ditch or leaving old trees um, in the woods next to your crop fields or your garden. And don't forget to give water to your pollinators because they also need that. So with that, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. And if there's time, we will happily take your questions. We have such a nice, um, cozy group. I wonder if people would like to just have a conversation. You don't necessarily have to show your faces, but it would be fine if you wanted to. Um, we do have a few questions that have come up during the, the talk that we can go through. Um, the first person asked whether Haley, you and Sarah are in touch with MAFCA and Maine Farmland Trust as you're doing your research. Our research? No, I'm, my question. My per, I, we can see the chat now, which is great. But um, my personal research does not interact with MAFCA or farmland, Maine Farmland Trust. Um, my research isn't necessarily an organic, though it can be applied to both. And then I don't know if Farmland Trust would care. I work, <laughs> I work with um, one of the staff members at Maine Farmland Trust on a project that is not a part of my research, but is a part of what our lab group is doing um, called the Climate Adaptation Fellowship. You can Google it if you're interested. It's cool. <laughs> okay. Um, then there are a couple of questions you showed a picture of um, a rain barrel and you were recommending drip irrigation. And I actually asked the question because I have two rain barrels, but I wondered how well it really worked to connect them to drip irrigation because I don't know if there's enough water pressure. Um, and someone else had a comment on that, but I'm curious to know what you two would say about it first. So you, the person who commented is correct that it, it depends on your personal plot of land. So if you have a steep slope, you can do just gravity fed irrigation systems um, through soak hoses or drip irrigation. If you don't, I'm sh and you, you could probably really, get a pump. If you really wanted to do drip and you wanted to have a rain barrel, you could easily hook up a little, little water pump. You um, get a little motor. Yeah. And okay. <laughs> okay. it would be that. a fun little plumbing experiment. <laughs> Uh, um, that your rain barrel might dry out pretty quickly too. Oh yeah, yep. But so, it, uh, it depends on how far your water is going. There's a lot of factors that would uh, sure. play into that, I think. And our um, um, audience member, Liz Stanley from University of Maine Extension <laughs> is also contributing that uh, rain barrels can be connected to drip systems if the slope is good or the barrel's elevated. And there's a filter before it goes into the line. Oh, yeah, food safety. We actually, we had a little bit about food safety in there, but then our presentation was long. So we took it out, which maybe should Basically, you got to be careful because if you have lead paint or if there's, there's various toxins on your roof, things on your roof that you don't want to be irrigating your vegetable plants or with barrel. necessarily. Uh -huh. So okay. better to use your rain barrel water for ornamentals, flowers, um, unless you are very sure that the water coming off of your roof is potable, potable which it honestly probably isn't. 
<laughs> just <laughs> so it's not that just that you're picking up things from the um the shingles on your roof is what no it mostly is that well, it's also okay. if you're like, yeah, yeah the yeah. standing water in the rain barrel also yeah okay well another question someone asked what is the recommended management cultural management for flea beetles on brassica vegetables <laughs> Liz is right. You just got to come <laughs> to me. <laughs> All right, let me read to everyone. She, you can see what she said. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Or use uh, row covers to protect your plants. Okay. All right. Um, another person is asking if new seeds are being developed to deal with the impacts of climate change. Yeah. yeah definitely. I do not know <laughs> all of them. Some examples. <laughs> But even, even just variety selection, research and variety selection is a huge deal in climate change, at least in agriculture. I can't really speak to ornamentals on that one, but I'm sure they're also doing this. Um, I used to work, when I worked for Vermont Extension, I worked on a research farm that just did cereal grains. We had about 32 varieties of winter wheat and like on its own. And then we had like 23 varieties of spring wheat and barley and all these different things, just testing how they um, reacted in the Vermont climate and also how resilient they were. So that's definitely happening. Um, and I'm sure seed breeders are doing the same thing. I know they are. So, uh Quick, but kind of unrelated thought, but I think it's really important. Liz is doing a great job of this, but I'm just gonna say extension is, they know everything. everything. <laughs> so if you are interested in something, just Google the thing you're interested in and add the word extension at the end and you will get so much good information. Yeah. Plus extension, yes. Yep. Very good. So um, Sarah, you mentioned at the beginning some types of plants that can reduce some of the vulnerability issues stemming from the change in climate. What types of plants are those? Yeah, so I've been looking at this question and I'm not entirely sure I know what it means, but I can kind of talk about, so I think, you know, the way that climate change is going to affect a lot of the food systems is that there's going to be higher temperatures and more drought, less water available. So there are ways to improve the resilience of your agricultural system, not necessarily a plant specifically, but a way to shift to a system that's more resilient. So that might mean agroforestry. So there are a lot of different ways that you can incorporate trees into your farming practice that can provide shade. They'll help with water retention, they'll help with soil quality. Um, and so that is a system that might reduce the vulnerability um, of food production to climate change. Um, you know, plants can also sequester carbon. So, um, by adding additional carbon to the soil, plants are helping us uh, to reduce our global vulnerability to climate change by actually just reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So I hope that is the answer to your question. And Barbara, were you asking about like variety and crop selection? Yes. That was uh, Barb Gage. Do you have any follow-up? Yeah. Barb? Yeah, that was a great talk, ladies. Um, it, I thought in the beginning that there had been some suggestions that you could just change, that there were certain plants that would reduce the, uh, their that by using certain plants, you'd be less vulnerable to the climate change. And I didn't know if there were certain ones that would um, work better in our our new climate that we'll be expecting. So in Maine, mm -hmm. in, in your personal gardens, or on, is that mm -hmm. what you're yeah. most interested in? Yep. Um, I think shifting to a perennial system is always a, or as many perennial plants as you can with like filling in with annuals. Uh, perennials 
just automatically have more resilience than annuals. Yeah. Individual varieties of crops and ornamentals, like I'm not sure the exact plants, but if I come across anything, I can send it to the library or to the Belfast Garden Club and they can pass it on I know, to folks. I know someone in Maryland who's doing research on um, heat tolerant vegetable and fruit mm -hmm. varieties. Um, and I know that she's trying to um, get that going and kind of move those varieties north. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I can't like spout off a list of varieties off the top of my head, but um, yeah. well, I could try to remember her name and pass that along and hopefully it will get to you. Okay, thanks. It was just, it was very interesting, your numbers about how much the temperatures are changing in Maine and the Northeast. And it, it seemed much more dramatic than I expected. So it, it made me think about, well, maybe we should be changing what we're planting. Yeah, <laughs> oh, definitely. You know, just look at Virginia agriculture. Like that's a short an way to answer the question. Okay. Is, what are they doing in places that are warmer? Yep. Variety yep. selection and is always a hard one. And often things like seed catalogs or seed providers, or if you go to like flower shows or crop shows, they often know the tolerance of their individual, the individual varieties. And they're really good resources as well as yep. extension, but all of these individual seed growers to know the hardiness of, of crops. Yeah. Oh, incidentally, uh, someone just mentioned uh, Johnny's seed catalogs, oh. <laughs> also mentioned by our speaker last week on plant diseases, because there's a tremendous amount of information yeah. in yes. that about all aspects of growing any kind of plant they're selling seeds for. So, And also, some of you can see um, Liz, I think, has put a couple of links to videos in the chat, one on watering your home garden and one on flea beetles, since we had a question on flea beetles, so. Thank you, Liz and Susan. Does anyone else have any questions for these ladies from Orono? <laughs> they go, huh? Good, good luck with all of your research. It's nice to know all of that is going on up there. Thank you. Great. And just uh, to remind you, our Garden Club program for March 15th, the noon program is going to be four different um, speakers talking about the school garden project in Belfast. So that'll be at noon on March 15th. That's it. I, okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And thank you, uh, Haley and Sarah, for all your work in preparing your presentation. And people are thanking you here. Yeah, thanks to both of you for a great presentation.